Amen. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if, you're, if you're new or visiting, a particularly warm welcome to you. It's so lovely to have you uh, in the room with us. Perhaps you haven't been to church, a church, this church, for uh, a little while now, uh, and it feels a little bit odd and a little bit strange. Um, that's because a lot of what we do is a bit odd and a bit strange, and there's some odd bods and some strange bods around the place. It's just the way it is, and we've learned to live with it, and I hope you will learn to live with it too. If you have a Bible this morning, or if you would like a Bible, would you turn to uh, John chapter 15? There's some uh, here and here if you want those. Um, We are looking at uh, a passage which uh, talks about us remaining in Jesus Christ. Us remaining in Jesus Christ. And we're going to wonder together uh, what that means. What's it mean to be in Jesus Christ? Uh, You will remember, hopefully, that we are in the middle of a, or we're actually at the end of a preaching series at the moment, looking at the good news. And that another word for that is the gospel. And if you have your notice sheets, would you like to just take those again with me? And just turn to the front there. And right at the very top, we are going to read this together. This is the gospel in 30 words. Hopefully you will memorise it. But let's say this together. Jesus is God with us. Come to set up God's kingdom. Save us from sin. Shut down religion and show us God's love so we can share in God's life. And over the last few weeks, we've been systematically breaking this down Uh, and trying to unpack a little bit more uh, the truths of who Jesus is and and what he came to do and what he still does by the power of his Holy Spirit. And we began by thinking, just after Christmas, the truth that Jesus is God with us. Emmanuel, incarnate of the Virgin Mary, became a human, became flesh. Uh, In Hebrews it says this, that the Son, Jesus, is uh, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, the exact representation of his being, not a photocopy, uh, not some fraudulent copy. Uh, He is no copy, he is the exact representation of the Father, of God. He is God. Uh, One theologian put it like this, that Jesus... uh, came to earth is God with uh, wrapped in human flesh. I don't know what you think of that language, but for me that, that helps uh, package an understanding of the greatness of, of God's being contained within uh, the beauty of, of our created being. He is God wrapped in human flesh. John 14, 7-9 says that anyone who has seen me, this is the words of Jesus, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So if you see Jesus, you see the Father. Look in the eyes of Jesus and you will see the Father. Hear the words of Jesus and you will hear the words of the Father. Begin to grasp the depths of Jesus' love for you and you will begin to grasp the depths of the Father's love for you. His ways and his thoughts, the thoughts of the Son are the thoughts of the Father because they are one in the same. When we see Jesus, we see God taking on flesh, taking on humanity. To be with us, yes. To be in the midst of us. In physical form. God in physical form in the midst of us. Because he is here for us. Not just some uh, creator who created this planet and sent it spinning and left it to its own devices, but is actively involved. He's actively involved. He is with us and for us. Uh, Here's some old uh, imagery, some classic imagery of how we have uh, come to understand uh, the relationship between God and us. Uh, We like to put this big gulf between us and God and we, we talk about the things that separate us from God. And we say that Jesus came right in the middle Uh, to be our advocate, to be our mediator. And and we like to think that because of Jesus, we can come to God. Because of the work of the Son, we can come to the Father. And that is right and true and proper. But here's a beautiful reality. 
Because of the person Jesus, God came to be with us. Because of the person Jesus, God came to be with us. And this is a recurring theme throughout Scripture. And you might remember the story of the prodigal son, where the father ran to meet the son. Here's a God that comes to meet with us. Uh, we then moved in to look at the gifts. If that was the ground of the gospel, the basis of the gospel, we then began to unpick the gifts of the gospel. And we began to think about the fact that Jesus came to set up God's kingdom. Uh, you, if you've been around this place for a little while now, Nathan's smiling because he knows where I'm going with this, you'll know this imagery. Uh, Jesus came to establish, to set up. If you're feeling particularly clever, you might think of the word inaugurated, God's kingdom. A kingdom that looks different to the kingdoms of this world. A kingdom which is marked out because it is a place of justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's a place where everything is right and proper and ordered and as it should be. Uh, And Jesus invites us in. He invites us to bring our kingdoms into his kingdom. It's a place of healing, a place of wholeness, a place of light. He calls us from darkness into life, from death into life, from chaos into peace, from sorrow into joy. A number of um, years ago, Lella, my wife, and I had the opportunity uh, to go abroad to a place that we will never go again. It was one of those holidays of a lifetime. And it was a very long trip. And the climate was going to be significantly different to how it is in this country. It was not cold. It was very, very hot. So I thought, I will wear shorts on the plane. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? I'm going to be walking out into what feels like a hairdryer blown all over me. I will wear shorts. <laughs> and um, so came down uh, the steps of the plane and walked into customs. And some gentlemen, some big, hurly gentlemen, pulled me to one side says, sir, you do realise you cannot wear those shorts in this country. You're having a laugh, mate. (laughs) Come on, you're kidding me. And they were saying it with such a big smile. I I was convinced they were joking. No, sir, come with us, please. Walked into a side room. Who knows what's going to happen next? You will have to remove those shorts. I had nothing with me. I just had shorts. All my luggage was in in the hold. What do you do in this? Uh, You don't want to know what what happened in the end. But uh, (laughs) I borrowed my brother-in-law's spare pair of trousers. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that they were combat trousers. They were combat shorts. They had a combat design. In this particular country, because it it had gone through a period of civil war, there was no. No civilians were allowed to wear combat patterns. The rules and the regulations of that particular kingdom were different to ours. This is the same with with the kingdom that God establishes, that Christ established. It's a place of joy and peace and love and goodness, but it also contains some boundaries that we may feel at times are slightly uncomfortable. But they are right and they are proper and they are ordered. And um, they go against this boundaryless society that we seem to that seems to be emerging. Uh, the next gift we looked at was that uh, Jesus came to save us from sin. Jesus came to save us from sin, and this tends to be the one that we, as evangelical Christians, tend to focus on more than any other about the work of God. We looked at two passages together, one uh, about a guy who was um, sick from paralysis and Jesus came and um, he was, Jesus was questioned about what he was going to do to this man. Are you going to heal him or are you going to forgive his sins? Well, you can't forgive his sins, only God can forgive this man's sins. You know what Jesus did? He healed the man and forgave the man his sins, forgave the man his sins and healed the man. He spoke authority. He spoke forgiveness. He spoke healing because he is, he was and he is the king who has every right to declare healing and forgiveness of sins. 
Well, we then moved on to wonder about the place of the cross as well. Well, if he was a man who could speak forgiveness and declare healing and wholeness, what's the place of the cross in all of this? Jesus came to save the whole person, body, mind, spirit, strength. His healing, his salvation is one of wholeness. He heals us from our sin and our sicknesses. The king declared his sovereignty. He declared in a word, you are forgiven, you are healed. And on the cross, he demonstrated his sovereignty. I am the king. And I don't stand for this in my kingdom. He declares, he demonstrates his sovereignty. He enables our transformation on the cross. Good morning. And he provides for, an, for us an example. What, G, what Jesus did was what the Father did. What he, the Father called him to do is what the Son did. And likewise, what Jesus did is what we are called into doing. We're involved in this story of salvation that began at creation and will come to its fulfilment, its consummation right at the end of time. We're involved to make lunch for those who are hungry. We're involved in salvation because we're called to clothe those who have no clothes. Those who are struggling in debt, we are called to stand alongside and help in the ways that we can. Those who are trapped in adultery, we are called to stand alongside them and to proclaim the truths of God's kingdom in their lives. Whatever the sin is, whatever the effects of that sin is, we are, we are called to be Christ's ambassadors, to do as we see the Son doing. The next gift that we looked at together was this truth that Jesus came to shut down religion. This is the one that tends to grate on a few of us. Shut down religion or fulfil religion? End religion or complete religion? Well, what did he do? Uh, religion was not a bad thing. Up to the time of Jesus, uh, it... Uh, it just become corrupt. A man had distorted this beautiful thing that was meant to uh, al allow us to be in right relationship with God. But because of our pride, because of our ego, because of our desire to be seen to be doing the right thing, our desire to have a hold on, on others around us, uh, the, the good stuff about religion, it just... It, it had gone the wrong way. It had become corrupt. It had become uh, broken. Religion said that you need to do the right thing in the right way at the right time. And what was happening amongst the Jewish people was it was breeding this culture of fear that if you don't do that, then something awful is going to happen. It's driving fear. Religion had become like an old pair of shoes. Have you ever had a pair of shoes that you love so dearly that you can't bear to see them go, even when they're <laughs> totally broken? I mean, they're totally knackered. They're totally falling apart. You, you wear them until you possibly can't wear them any longer. And then they get to the point where your feet are starting to trip over themselves and, you know, you're, you're bleeding. And, it's, <laughs> and you know, you get to that point, you just know this... My old friends, it's time for us to depart from one another. The law had become like that old pair of shoes. It just, you know, they'd been wearing it for as long as possible. But it just got to the point where it was obsolete. It was no longer uh, as it should be. It was no longer doing the job that it should be doing. It was no longer fit for purpose. Jesus came and he said, I give you a new covenant. I give you a new way of doing things. I give you a new pair of shoes. A new law I give you, a new covenant. This was the old one, love the Lord your God, and then a load of other laws underneath that that helped them supposedly to love the Lord your God. Jesus said, I haven't come to remove that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, everything that you have within you. Jesus said this, and love your neighbour as yourself. It's a new way. It's a new way of doing it. No longer did Jesus uh, 
want to see people trapped under the yoke of, of religion. He wanted them to be freed by living relationship with God. <coughs> and then um, last week, uh, we finished up the gifts of the gospel, namely that Jesus came to show us God's love. Jesus came to show us God's love. And you might remember um, Mark wonderfully um the truth of this reality. He, he began by thinking about the, the, the Trinity, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit living in perfect community with one another, perfect love with one another. In, in the very depths of their being, uh, Scripture says this in 1 John 4, 16, that God is love. He doesn't just act with love, he is the very personification of love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God lives in them. Uh, but he isn't just, he isn't just love, he, he is love and he also is loving in his doing, in his action, in his ethic. He so loved, so loves the world, he demonstrated it, he enacted upon that love by giving his one and only son, his beautiful, cherished son for the sake of humanity. He loved the world so much that he allowed his son to suffer horrendously and to die in our place so that we could have life and life in all its fullness. And so we arrive at today, the goal of all of this. Well, what's the point? It's a great question to ask. What's the point? What's the reason? Why? Why did Jesus come to be with us? Why did he set up this kingdom? Why did he uh, save people from sin? Why did he shut down religion? Why did he show us uh, his love? What was the point? And here's the beautiful message of this morning. Because he doesn't, he doesn't want heaven without us. He wants us to share in his love. And to share in his life. Isn't that beautiful? Here's, here's God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit living together in, in perfect love, each, each independent person but one in their being. You know this, this truth, God is Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, one being, three persons but one being. Here's the next truth. They are completely unified. They're in perfect community with one another. The old uh, church fathers of old, going back thousands of years, spoke about this beautiful dance, a dance of love between Father, Son and, and Holy Spirit, where one was uh, seeking the honour and praise of the other and, and the, the, the Father was pointing to the, to the Son and saying, look at him, look at him. The Son was pointing to the Spirit. and Look at him, look at him, look, the Spirit to the Father. Look, look, it's all about this other person. They were just constantly in this beautiful dance of, of adoration and praise and worship and, and honour, just living in beautiful fellowship with one another. Here is a beautiful truth that we're going to read about this morning. So if you'd like to take your Bibles, John chapter 15, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You've already, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory. Always pointing 
always pointing to the other one. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We talk about whole life disciples in this church. If you want to be his disciple, remain in him. If you remain in him, you will bear much fruit. To be in Christ, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> How could we possibly be in Christ? So we began with the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One, but three persons, living in perfect fellowship with one another, always uh, pointing to the other people. Now here's an image of us being brought up into that place of relationship, being brought up into that community. Uh, like a fan whizzing away that just, whoosh, it, all, it all comes up. So we are brought into that place of relationship. How do we do it? Do we do it on our own? Do we do it from our own strength, in our own strength? No, we are, we are raised, we are sat in heavenly places because of Christ Jesus. We are united with Christ Jesus. We remain in Christ and are brought up into relationship with the Father and the Spirit. To be in Christ is to be in uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit, is to be in the midst of the Trinity, in the midst of community, to be brought into union uh, with God. So as Jesus is lifted up, those who remain in Christ are lifted up. Here's a beautiful thing. As the Son is honoured, so we receive the honour. This is what we lost when the fall happened. Being in perfect harmony and, and beautiful community. Not God's. Let's make that clear. Not God's in our own like. But like, like God in, in, in our actions and in our being. Because as we remain in the place of love, as we remain in the place of joy, as we remain in the place of peace. So, so we pick this stuff up. Do you remember uh, at school this, uh, the teaching on osmosis? Can you remember that teaching? You just kind of absorb the stuff just by being close to it. So being clo by being close to God by remaining in Christ. So we, so we become more loving, more joyful, more peaceful. Here's a passage from uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Here's, that's the Father's divine power, the Spirit, has given us everything we need for a godly life. So there's a purpose, there's a reason for it, to become more godly. Through our knowledge of him, that's the Son, who called us, he's calling us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. This is a call to interrelationship. This is a call to share life with God once again. And it was the work of the Son that made it possible for us to participate, to share life. And life in all its fullness, the truest, truest meaning of life. The art of, of being is the art of becoming, and the art of becoming is the art of being. The more we are, so the more we become. The more you are, love, the more you become more loving. Uh, let's take the example of generosity. Um, I don't know if you're one of those people that finds generosity easy uh, or hard. The art is in the practice. The more I practice generosity, the easier it becomes to be generous. The more I loosen my hand and my wallet, uh, the looser it will become. Now, this is the same as if I am practicing an instrument or practicing uh, some kind of sporting activity. The more I do it, the better I become at it. And the better I become at it, the more I do it. The more we 
enter in, the more we remain uh, in the vine, in Jesus Christ, the more we become like him and we exhibit uh, his being and, and his characteristics, the things that he does. Remain in me. It couldn't be clearer from Jesus. Remain in me. Uh, we're, we're, we're good with the language of remain, aren't we, in this country? Well, we're trying to work out what it means to remain anyway. Remain in me. Remain in me. Stay in me. Or not, <laughs> as the case may be. Here, Jesus, it's a call to remain. Don't, don't Brexit. Don't, what would the like God version of that be? Grexit? Who knows? <laughs> don't depart from God. Remain in him. Remain in him. And as we remain, so he remains in us. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. To love perfectly, to uh, demonstrate peace, to uh, exhibit joy. I mean, we can try with all our might, but I think we'll probably fail if we don't remain in Christ. Because no branch can bear fruit by itself. You can't do it on your own. It must remain. It must stay in the vine, which is Jesus. Again, he says, uh, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I mean, it's such a simple message, isn't it? It couldn't be clearer. Remain in Christ. To remain in Christ is to share in God's life. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you again, it's emphasised, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, if you don't remain in me, you won't bear anything. Again, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Remain in Christ. To remain in Christ is to share in God's life. God's life is different to his kingdom. God's life is his very being. God's kingdom is where he exerts his rule and his reign and his authority. Yes, he's calling us into his kingdom where peace, joy, love, patience, kindness, goodness is exhibited. Yes, he's calling us into his kingdom where there are certain rules and, and regulations and boundaries and ways of things. But, but this is a call uh, not just into his kingdom but to his very being into relationship with him. And it is in that place, that is the place of fruitfulness and fullness. Now, we, Jesus doesn't say here whether this is about making other disciples or, or becoming a better Christian or whatever it might be. Fruitfulness and, and uh, f uh, faithfulness and fruitfulness, I'm sure, includes those things right at the top, but uh, this could be fruitfulness and faith and, and fullness in your relationships, uh, in, your, in your work, in your parenting, how you are with your spouse, your partner. Whatever you are seeking uh, fullness and faithfulness in, I've got a strong feeling that if you do it with Christ, it's going to be greater than if you do it alone. His, his, being, his life, being in him, it's a place of completion and it's a place of accomplishment. Uh, we, within the church, wider, we don't like talking about success. Uh, we think this is a dirty word. <laughs> we, we rather talk about fruitfulness and I think that's right. I think that's way more biblical than success. But maybe if it helps you to think of what fruitfulness looks like, uh, maybe you might understand that more in terms of success. His life is joy and peace and hope. In the very depths of his being, it's a place of redemption and a place of reconciliation. His life, his life is a place that we call home. When that father welcomed the prodigal home, 
He was welcoming him back into life. Back into life in all its fullness. Not just a lovely story of reconciliation, of restored relationships, but the restoration of life itself. That's all very well, Joel, but how on earth do you remain in the vine? How on earth do you stay in that place? Well, I'm going to leave that for someone else to preach about next week. And over the next few weeks, in fact, we're going to be thinking more about what it means to abide, to remain, to be uh, in God's presence, to, be, uh, to share in his life. We're going to be thinking about s- slowing down. We're going to be thinking about listening for God's word, about accountability and encouragement, about communion. And, and as we head towards uh, the passion narrative, God's passion for his world, demonstrated most perfectly on the cross where Christ died for us and subsequently rose again and ascended to be with his father, and what it means to live in the power of the resurrection, to abide, to remain in that place. I, I want to finish this morning by saying that remaining is a daily choice. It's a daily choice. Uh, the truth is that when we make a, a commitment to Jesus Christ, we choose to be in him, to place our life into his life. Yet that's also a daily decision for us to make. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, you should follow me. Yes, pick up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. These are daily practices, daily behaviours. So this morning I'm going to, shall we stand together? I'm going to invite you to stand and... And as you, you might like to close your eyes. And just for a moment, um, assess or audit or, or just have a think about how you're, how, how you're going with remaining in Jesus. That's, that's being close to him, as close as you could possibly be. Maybe you've never come into that depth of relationship before and this morning you want to step into that place, step into life with Christ. Begin sharing your life with God and God's life with you. Or maybe you recognise that um, it's like you've perhaps fallen from a height. There was once a, 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 a place where you felt particularly close to God, like you were sharing in life, you were in harmony, in sync with God, but you just moved away from that place and you want to get back to that place. And maybe this is a lived thing for you and just you get what I'm talking about. And today, today you want to choose to remain in Christ. I'm going to pray now, and if you'd like to join in with that, you are so welcome. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. The Spirit of Jesus is present here. Lord, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our lives. You know the journey that we have travelled even this morning. Perhaps we recognise that we haven't uh, been exhibiting a life that is one which could be said to be remaining with you. Lord, would you come this morning by your Holy Spirit and, and fill this place with your atmosphere, with your love. May we have a great awareness of your working this morning amongst us as we lift our hearts, our hands, our minds to you, our lives to you. Would you come and shape us, conform us and form us more into the likeness of your Son so that we may be raised up and become more like you.